Hi, everybody. Um, I think we still have some people who are dialing into the webinar, but we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation today because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Um, so first of all, thanks to all of, uh, all of you who are on the call uh, and welcome. We're going to be presenting today on uh, some of the work that Advanced CTE has been doing uh, related to rural CTE, looking at lessons and strategies for reaching rural learners. We've been hearing for some years that one of the uh, biggest equity challenges that the CTE community faces is serving rural students. So last year, Advanced CTE began an effort to understand the challenges facing rural communities and to identify promising practices and strategies to strengthen access to high quality rural CTE pathways. So today we're gonna to explore some of those strategies. On the agenda, we're going to look at some common rural CTE challenges, we're going to explore strategies to expand access to high quality CTE in rural areas. And then we're going to hear from, uh, from Amy Lorenzo in Idaho, who's going to share a little bit about Idaho's statewide strategy for addressing rural challenges. And we're going to look specifically at Idaho's program quality initiative as a model for applying some of the uh, rural access strategies. My name is Austin Estes. I'm a Senior Policy Associate with Advanced CTE. And as I mentioned, we're also joined today by Amy Lorenzo, who is the Director of Policy and Organizational Planning at the Idaho Division of CTE. She's also graciously provided a lot of input and support into this work. And Idaho has actually been featured in a couple of the briefs. So just to kind of paint the landscape of rural education, there's a significant education gap between rural and urban adults. Only 28% of rural adults hold an associate's degree or higher, compared to 41% of urban adults. In a lot of cases, a lack of education in rural areas is associated with higher poverty. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, four out of five low education counties are rural, and these counties are more likely to experience high rates of poverty compared to other counties. While economic activity often gravitates towards urban hubs, Rural areas still offer many opportunities for gainful employment and career success, but the challenge facing, facing states is figuring out the right approach to improve access and success and close the rural-urban education divide. In our conversation with state CTE leaders, we learned about a variety of different, a variety of different issues facing rural communities, which we bucketed into four overarching challenges. First of all, ensuring rural programs meet high standards of quality, connecting learners to employers and to the world of work, providing a diverse menu of different career pathways opportunities, and strengthening the CTE teacher and faculty pipeline. These are challenges that are present in all geographic regions, but a closer look at national data shows that these are particularly pressing challenges in rural areas. So one particularly vexing challenge in rural areas is balancing access with quality. We all know that programs should be held to high standards of quality and rigor, which means ensuring that curriculum is validated by industry, that learners can access post-secondary opportunities and accrue post-secondary credits while in high school, and that there are protocols in place to phase out low-quality programs. There are countless examples of high-quality CTE programs in rural areas. But the challenge for states is figuring out how to set appropriate guardrails to make sure that these are not islands of excellence, but rather the norm, and that all CTE programs meet a baseline level of quality. So here's a quick snapshot of the quality of the nation's CTE programs. According to a recent survey from the National Center of Education Statistics, 60% of rural districts report that most or all CTE programs are structured as career pathways, meaning that they uh, include a sequence of courses that are aligned from secondary to post-secondary. Additionally, 67% of rural school districts say that students can earn both high school and post-secondary credit through their program of study, and 41% say that labor market data plays a large role in considering which programs to add. So overall, not bad, but there's still a lot of work to do to get rural programs up to par with their counterparts in other geographic areas. Another critical challenge facing rural areas is making sure that employers are engaged and that learners have opportunities to connect with the world of work. We all know that employers play a critical role in students' education. They can help, help them explore different career options, 
They can provide guidance and mentorship. They can offer work-based learning opportunities and placements for students, and they can provide critical input into CTE curriculum and design. But in many rural areas, the lack of a diverse employer base can make it challenging to connect learners, learners to these opportunities. Looking at the same survey, we see that 19% of rural school districts report, report that employers are involved to a large or very large extent in providing work-based learning. Additionally, 22% of rural school districts say that employers are involved to a large or very large extent in hosting student field trips. So clearly there's a need in rural districts for a more comprehensive strategy to broker meaningful interactions between students and industry experts even if that means bridging geographic divides and using technology to connect students with employers virtually. Another challenge that we heard from states is that local schools and colleges often face trade-offs between offering a broad uh, variety of different program offerings or going deep in one or two career pathways. All too often, rural areas with limited staff, financial resources, and a small student population must choose to either uh, offer a breadth of uh, introductory course offerings across a variety of different fields or go deep in one or two areas. So it's important for rural leaders to think outside the box and take advantage of technology and partnerships to expand learner access to meaningful opportunities. And then finally, it probably comes as no surprise, but one of the leading challenges that we heard from states is recruiting uh, qualified CTE teachers and faculty and ensuring that there's a strong pipeline to recruit individuals into the classroom. Across the board, 57% of public school districts with CTE teacher vacancies report that these vacancies are difficult to fill, which is far higher than for academic positions. And while this is a challenge in any geographic setting, this is a particularly pressing issue in rural areas where finding and recruiting qualified CTE teachers can make or break a program. Over the past year, Advanced CTE has led an effort to study and identify best practices for serving rural CTE students. This work is generously funded by J.P. Morgan Chase as part of the New Skills for Youth initiative. In that time, we've released four briefs, each one addressing one of the four challenges that we've laid out uh, just now. We've also put together a cheat sheet to identify federal funding opportunities to support rural career pathways, as well as a strategy guide that lays out essential questions and reflection opportunities for state and local leaders to develop a comprehensive uh, strategy for serving rural students. Each of these resources is available online at the Learning Networks Resource Center. So while it's easy to document the challenges facing rural CTE, we also wanted to highlight some strategies that state and local leaders could take away to improve the delivery of rural CTE. So we looked across all of the states that we spoke with. We had more than a dozen conversations with different state leaders, uh, as well as some local leaders, and we saw five key strategies emerge from the work. These strategies can be used by state and local leaders to examine the CTE delivery system and identify opportunities to expand access and strengthen high quality career pathways in rural areas. So the first strategy is to secure buy-in and commitment for ongoing reforms. Change is never easy and requires not only a strong vision of where you wanna go, but also buy-in and support from the stakeholders who will be responsible for implementing the change. So what does this look like in practice? First of all, state and local leaders should look at their state vision and goals and see where rural access to CTE fits in. Should look and see if it's a priority in the state or if there are other statewide initiatives or goals that rural CTE can support. It's also important to identify key stakeholders and champions at the state and local levels, because these people can be brought in early and provide critical input and guidance to build support for the initiatives. One example of this is Nebraska's Revision Initiative, which was started in 2013 using Perkins Reserve dollars to catalyze local CTE planning and improvement efforts. Through the initiative, local districts and school leaders, mostly in rural areas, brought together teachers, counselors, and business leaders to identify program gaps and 
co-develop an action plan to improve CTE quality. The second strategy is to use data strategically to understand access gaps and assess programmatic and policy impact. Looking at performance and outcome data can help state and local leaders identify these gaps. They can look and see if populations are being underserved and whether rural students are enrolling in and succeeding in CTE programs at the same rate as their peers across the state. A data-driven approach to program improvement can also help cash-strapped school districts determine where to deploy resources and supports to achieve the greatest impact. It's also important for states to look at, and local leaders to look at labor market data, especially labor market data that is accessible and timely. Um, and, and it can be used to ensure program offerings are aligned with high skill, high demand industries. Such alignment helps secure future career options for, for learners and ensures that employers have access to a talent pool that allows their businesses to be successful. The third strategy is to leverage regional cross-sector partnerships to expand capacity and reach more learners. This is actually where we saw the most innovation from the states that we spoke with. Rural districts and colleges aren't letting themselves be constrained by the size of their student populations or the limits of their budgets. They're tapping into regional industry networks, partnering with colleges and school districts in their area, and pooling resources to reach economies of scale. One example of this is in North Dakota where four community colleges banded together to create the Dakota Nursing Program, a regional partner-led approach to strengthen the pipeline of healthcare professionals in the state. Through the network, local hospitals and healthcare providers in rural areas serve as satellite campuses. They host community college faculty and provide work-based learning opportunities for students while they pursue their LPN or RN certification. And as a result of the Dakota Nursing Program, more than 2,000 nursing certifications have been awarded to rural students. Another effective practice is using technology to expand access and reach. A lot of the access gaps that rural students face can be mitigated by technology. If you look at states like Nebraska and Louisiana, they're adopting new technologies uh, and using web video and web conferencing to connect learners with employers across geographic region exposing them to different career options and allowing them to visualize the workplace uh, and experience their career of interest. But it's important to consider how technology can be both a blessing and a curse. State and local leaders should deploy solutions with intention, making sure that technology is used to supplement but not replace enriching real-world learning opportunities. And for communities that have limited broadband access, state and local policymakers should look at interim solutions for example, outfitting school buses with Wi-Fi that can help learners bridge the technological divide. And lastly, state and local leaders should look at how they can invest resources strategically to spark innovation in rural schools. We all know that money doesn't grow on trees, but there are often funds available through federal and state programs that can be braided together to support CTE in rural communities. Perkins, for example, allow states to set aside up to 10% of their local state local Perkins grants to use in a reserve fund, which can be used to support uh, funding in rural areas. The Every Student Succeeds Act also provides opportunities for funding rural communities. Some states such as South Dakota have also taken measures to level the playing field and give rural districts an advantage in the grant process. Several years ago, South Dakota launched a new multi-million dollar grant program called the Workforce Education Fund to strengthen career pathways in communities across the state. The grants are distributed competitively based on nine criteria, one of which includes the geographic region of the, of the community. This helps smaller, under-resourced institutions compete with larger districts for critical funding. To get the most bang for their buck, states should also give local leaders the room to identify their own needs and deploy resources in the most effective way, while also monitoring how funds are being used and locating strategies and practices that can be scaled across the state. So that's a quick overview of the five strategies that we identified through the CTE on the Frontier research. And each of these is described in more detail in the Rural Strategy Guide. But with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Amy Lorenzo from Idaho 
who's going to walk us through some of the challenges that Idaho faced and talk about some of the strategies that they're using to expand access to high quality CTE. Great, thank you, Austin. And I, I also just wanted to give a special thanks to Advanced CTE for not only focusing on this issue, but for inviting us to the table and letting us be a part of the process. I think Idaho is not unique in this challenge, uh, nor are we unique in our commitment to how do we improve the student learning outcomes and help ensure that all students have access to high quality CTE experiences. I wanted to provide you with just a brief overview of our state and kind of what our landscape looks like to provide some context to kind of what our journey has been and what we're doing right now to help improve rural connectivity. So Idaho is a predominantly rural state. In fact, 73% of our districts are considered rural. Uh, we have overall within that landscape approximately 40% of our students are served within a rural district. 46% of our administrators work in a rural district, and 40% of all our overall teachers are in a rural district. So we have a fairly large state geographically with a lot of pockets of small communities. And within that, we still have a unified goal that CTE is focused on creating a talent and career pipeline. We want to attract students while expanding capacity and having continuous approve, uh, program improvement. I think, you know, Austin really hit the nail on the head when he talks about this balance between quality and access. And even if you are in a district that has a very limited number of offerings, helping to ensure that all students who participate in CTE are going to be equally prepared for those next steps. So there's been a couple of things that we have experienced and that we worked on uh, to help accomplish that within our state. When we look at these strategies um, and talk about the balance between quality and access, so Idaho has implemented a number of initiatives, which I think are common in many states. In order to ensure our program quality, all of our pathway programs do undertake a technical skill assessment. And this is, assessment is designed to provide an indication of how well a student understands the technical components of their program. Students take this during their capstone and it really should reflect everything that they've learned throughout their CT experience. We also require every student, every senior, in at least their second CTE course to take the workplace readiness assessment. One of the key benefits of this assessment is for our students who may be in a cluster program uh, or who may have just had a preliminary exposure to CTE because we want all of our students to have a good understanding of what's going to be expected of them as they transition to not just their next level of education, but into the workforce. We also have had a very concerted effort on technical competency credit. And this also ties into our program diversity initiative because we want our students to have the skills and ability to move throughout different parts of the state. So Idaho is working on a statewide articulation framework that will allow our students to test for uh, technical competency credit at any one of the institutions, and then those credits would transfer to another institution throughout the state. So what that does for our rural students in particular is it gives them the access and mobility to a post-secondary program and employment that may not be available within their local community. So it's been a great tool where a very early implementation of this initiative, but our goal is to provide students with more choice and more opportunities throughout more parts of the state. The other thing that Idaho is working on is our internships and our pre-apprenticeships and our school to register apprenticeship programs. And we recognize that the landscape for these programs varies according to the community and according to the program type. But we also recognize that these targeted educational opportunities, get those students connected with relevant employment earlier on, which helps them keep them in the workforce and helps them stay connected to additional post-secondary education opportunities. Because of Idaho's large geographic nature and because of the number of rural districts, we also are a state that has taken advantage of career technical schools. Some states call these career technical centers, but they are indeed the central spot for students to participate in solely CTE activities. Idaho has 17 career technical schools. 
These are regional programs that pull students in from a multitude of districts. If I look at the overall premise of our career technical schools, uh, the easiest way to talk about them is better and different. Uh, we use our career technical schools to not only maximize scarce resources, but to provide students, particularly in some of our rural districts, with the opportunity to have the depth and breadth of a CTE experience that they probably wouldn't get in their comprehensive high school. I will be the first to admit that we have some limitations with this, uh, primarily in terms of scheduling and transportation, and I think Austin has talked a little bit about the role of technology in helping to bridge some of those gaps. Uh, we also have a statewide partnership with our online learning platform in Idaho. It is funded through the state of Idaho. It's called Idaho Digital Learning, and we partner with them to offer some of our introductory CTE courses online to help get those kids foot in the door and get them some preliminary exposure and positive experiences with CTE. And the last thing that we're doing is working on our teacher pipeline. We struggle not just with recruitment, but with teacher retention, particularly as we look at the retention rates for our teachers from industry. So last year we launched our Inspire Cohort Program, which is designed specifically to provide teachers who are coming from industry with either a low or no cost option to get the training and certification they need to become a permanent CTE teacher. One of the unique things about this program is that it also provides ongoing mentorship from other CTE teachers within the region to help provide those new teachers with a better support structure and help foster their long-term success. So Austin talked a little bit about the, our program quality initiative, and I've alluded to some of the things that we have worked on in our state's general framework, but we have a new initiative that we've launched this year that we are optimistic is really going to help change the landscape of how we help support our rural districts, and I think really ties in nicely with Advanced CTE's Rural CTE Strategy Guide. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit about what the Program Quality Initiative was, how it came to be, and what we're hoping to see from these efforts in the long term. The first thing that we looked at when we looked at the goal of the Program Quality Initiative was really to identify standard performance measures to help us understand how well our programs are doing. So this, again, ties back into that program quality to help ensure our programs are doing what they're supposed to be doing. We wanted there to be a way to provide our schools and districts with meaningful data on how well their programs were doing. So the initial intent of this was to give our programs and our districts an assessment of where their students are falling in overall performance and where their teachers may need some additional support. We also wanted to develop a formal mechanism to help improve the quality of our programs on an annual statewide and systemic level. In doing that, however, we did not want to create an additional reporting burden for our districts, so we wanted to identify some strategies that would use that with existing reporting functions and systems that we knew were comprehensive and reliable. And ultimately, in building this foundation, what we had hoped to do was to lay the groundwork for identifying a funding source for our CTE program, both for performance-based funding and to provide technical assistance grants. So in order to implement the Program Quality Initiative, it really relied on a lengthy and thoughtful process that involved a significant amount of outreach and stakeholder input. In order for this project to succeed, one of the things we had to get was buy-in from not only legislators who were going to help fund this initiative, but from the teachers and administrators who were going to have the opportunity to participate in the process. And what we realized very early on, in order for this initiative to carry any weight, we needed to identify performance measures that meant something to the field. One of the things that we didn't want to do was come up with some sort of statewide reporting system or some sort of grant program and identify programs as either high performing or struggling using data that didn't res resonate with the field. So the first thing we did in order to develop the grant was begin working with stakeholders um, and when we talk about stakeholders in this context, we're talking primarily about our educators and our administrators. We pulled in groups from all different parts of the state. Idaho has six 
education regions. So we brought them in. They represented a variety of CTE programs and a variety of program sizes. And so you, we used that opportunity to really drill down to them on what they thought the components of a healthy CTE program looked like. And that's really how we talked about it. Uh, we didn't want to set this up that was simply going to be a ranking system that, that pitted programs against each other. Instead, we really wanted this to be a meaningful tool for districts and teachers to use to get a better sense of how well their programs were working and what areas they needed to focus on for improvement. So you can see here that the preliminary conversation started in 2015, and that um, was that initial focus group that we worked with educators and administrators to say, high in the sky, if you could look at every performance measure that mattered to you, what were the types of things that you would want to consider within your CTE programs? And they came up with a comprehensive laundry list, um, everything from membership to ACTE, to the percentage of their CTE students who are concentrators, to whether or not their staff were st attending our state's professional development conference. So we started working through those measures and very quickly realized that although many of these measures had merit and should carry weight in how we look at our programs, we didn't necessarily have access to all of these data elements. In conjunction with this, we began our first request to the legislature to begin a preliminary appropriation for these efforts. As we were working on these performance measures, uh, we submitted our first request to the legislature for $300,000. And unfortunately, the governor's office decided not to support the implementation of this initiative during the 2016 legislative session. So our work on the initiative stalled for a few years as we tried to develop some additional stakeholder support and work with our legislature to help them understand the value of CTE for all of our students and what they could do to help support its growth and sustainability. So when we looked at this again, we waited some time for some time to pass and help get more traction to support what we were trying to implement, and ultimately, we came back later that fall and looked at what those performance measures were that we actually had access to and that we could actually measure. And you can see here, just between June and October, as we continue to work on these efforts, there are a number of measures that we knew as a state we didn't have access to or couldn't evaluate on a statewide meaningful level. So as we talk about using data, to strategically understand gaps and assess impact, these are the types of things that we as a state had to be mindful of. Because if we were only able to get this information for a small number of districts or a small number of teachers, it wasn't going to let us evaluate all of our programs with the same lens. So we immediately took a number of elements off the list, at least in the short term. And then the program stalled, again, as I mentioned, as we were working with our legislature and our governor to reiterate the value of this initiative. And so in that period of time, two years passed. Uh, we had two years in a row that we made that proposal to support the initiative, and two years in a row we did not get support. So by this time, we have eliminated even more measures. And you could see here that by October of 2017, we had narrowed our initiative to the three key measures uh, that we have used actually to launch this initiative. We looked at the technical skill assessment on the overall pass rate for how students did. We looked at their overall success on the workplace readiness assessment. And we introduced a new concept um, in looking at the active CTSO involvement. Idaho is a state that has prioritized uh, career technical student organizations as a key leadership component for our program, but we have never really assessed the extent to which our programs have active chapters or what that membership looks like compared to student organizations in other uh, parts of the state and other parts of even within their district. So we looked at these measures and we did a preliminary invitation to our districts, um, inviting them to apply for the first round of grants. Now, during our 2017 legislative session, we had a very pleasant surprise. Um, after our governor's office decided not to support it, we had a number of legislators who came to the table and said, we support CTE, we support what you're trying to do, and we are going to give you 
$300,000 in an ongoing appropriation to help support the program quality initiative. And so we sent invitations to the field um, for all of those programs using those three key measures. If they fell below the statewide average for their technical skill assessment, their workplace readiness assessment, or their overall career technical student organization membership. As you can see on this slide, we have had a tremendous uh, response to this incentive grant. We were able to award almost the full amount. We had a total of, I think, just over, we had 94 applications representing 46 districts. We had a total request of just over $875,000. So we had to do quite a bit of work to try to whittle down the request and get that money out to the field in a way that was going to be manageable and meaningful. We made a total of 44 awards to 26 districts. One of the key things here is when we looked at the distribution of funds, of those 44 awards, 30 of them went specifically to a rural district. Now of the total $300,000 appropriation, 180,000 of that money went to rural districts and rural programs. So it aligns very closely with the overall percentage of our districts that are rural and really was the first time that we were able to demonstrate an overt investment in our rural districts and really recognize some of the challenges they face in terms of infrastructure and access to materials and really as an agency do our part to help level the playing field and ensure that students in those districts can have access to quality programs, quality equipment, and quality educational materials. One of the key things that we used in terms of making our decision on awarding the grants uh, was helping to ensure that we were assessing the quality of the application using specific and standardized award criteria. So the first thing that we looked at was whether or not they submitted a clear application. And I know that that sounds a little bit unnecessary, but we had a lot of districts who weren't really able to articulate the value out of the request that they were making. That we had left the application wide open in terms of the types of purchases that districts or programs could potentially apply for. This meant that we had applications that could be as expensive as a vehicle or as little as a cotton candy machine. But the key thing here is the next bullet, that it needed to not only align with their eligibility criteria, it needed to provide a meaningful link to program improvement. So we were looking for two things here. Was the application aligned with what their qualifying performance measures were? So if you had low performance on your technical skill assessment within your business program, what we didn't want to see was an application for a family and consumer science program. And we also wanted to really encourage our teachers and administrators to collaborate together. Uh, we required joint signatures on this application as a demonstration of a good faith effort that both the teachers of the programs and the administrators within that district were working together for a shared and common goal. So we used that as a, a little bit of a litmus test to see how well these applications did in terms of providing that meaningful link to program improvement. Because what we wanted to see was the thoughtfulness in terms of what this investment would look like to help change the landscape within that program, particularly within some of our rural districts. We also wanted to see if there was the ability to serve multiple programs or career technical student organizations. And this was particularly true with some of our rural districts who really identified some mechanisms or investments that could help support more than one of their CTE programs. And that's where the last piece ties in, the demonstration of innovation within CTE. And I'll admit, the last two bullets are probably the most subjective. Um, in looking at a district's ability to demonstrate how well it's going to serve multiple programs or how well it's going to demonstrate innovation, we really provided our districts and our programs a significant amount of latitude to really think creatively which is why we ended up at the end of our grant, we funded everything from new computers to two cotton candy machines. It was a minimal investment on our part, but the district did a very compelling job of demonstrating within their rural district that that would provide as a significant fundraising opportunity for multiple career and technical student organizations. And we wanted to support that because we recognized 
but the needs within different communities are different. And we wanted to use this grant as an opportunity to customize what some of that support might look like to help them be successful in their own local environments. I did want to point out that as we've gone through this process, um, it has been three and a half years that we've been working on this. And we just barely sent out our first distribution of checks this last spring. So it's a long, slow road, and we don't actually have information yet on what the long-term outputs or outcomes are going to be with this initiative. What we do know is that the legislature has again supported this, and during the 2018 legislative session, they added to our ongoing appropriation, and we now are permanently funding the Program Quality Initiative at $600,000 a year. We are planning on asking for additional funds because our ultimate goal is to provide at least $1 million in ongoing funding to help support the work of what this initiative is trying to accomplish. But as we've gone through this process, I think one of the key lessons that we've learned is the importance of stakeholder input. We had a significant amount of input and buy-in from both our teachers and administrators not only on the performance measures that we were using, but the award criteria that we used in terms of evaluating how we distributed those funds to the field. One of the key areas that we had to work on, as I mentioned, was our relationship and partnership with our legislature and with our governor's office to help them understand our intent with these funds and how it could really change the landscape for some of our rural district. We also learned that good policy development takes time. And for those of you who have been through the policy process, it is much better to take your time and write language that has the sustainability and the language that's going to minimize unintended consequences and minimize those unintended negative impacts. And sometimes that's just worth waiting for. I think the key thing that we also learned on this, and as I showed you with how we started with our data development, that successful implementation of these types of initiatives really relies on understanding and accepting your data limitations. When we started this project, we were overly ambitious on what we thought we were going to be able to measure and what story we were going to be able to tell. And I think that really set us up for a much longer road. Um, trying to do too much too soon may mean you're not able to do anything at all. And I think lastly, and I, I know this sounds very counterintuitive sometimes within the world of education, but sometimes too much money can be a bad thing. Um, in our case, it has worked out very successfully to have slow and incremental growth because we've really been able to be mindful of how we want to invest these dollars. And I think had we had the comprehensive appropriation the first time we asked for it, um, we probably would not have been as thoughtful in terms of developing our strategies on who our target audience was and what we were expecting in terms of long-term benefits from the grant itself. So with that, I'm going to turn the time back over to Austin, and we'll talk more specifically about how to apply the five strategies. Great, thank you so much, Amy. Um, and I think the Program Quality Initiative uh, is a, or the, uh, yeah, the PQI is a great example of um, kind of a comprehensive statewide approach to applying these five strategies in a way that reaches um, rural CTE students and allows districts to innovate and really target those resources to meet their needs. Um, so I know you've uh, covered a lot of these topics uh, through the presentation, but I just kind of want to draw it back to some of the strategies that we saw through the CTE on the Frontier Initiative. So um, I'm just going to go through each one of these uh, one by one and just see how you applied those strategies through, uh, through your work developing the uh, Program Quality Initiative and then implementing it in its uh, first year. So, to start off, um, can you talk a little bit about um, how kind of your approach to getting buy-in and commitment at the local and the state level? I know you talked some about organizing focus groups with teachers and administrators, um, but what, what kind of was your approach to that and why is stakeholder engagement so important to this work? So I think that's a great question and I will tell you that it's so much easier to have the conversation with our teachers and administrators that whether, whether it is a direct benefit to them or an accountability measure or a state or federal mandate, saying to the table, we want to do this with you, we don't want to do this to you, changes the entire dynamic of the process. And what we learned throughout this was that 
no matter how well intended we thought the initiative was, we recognize that our stakeholders and ultimately our district who would be receiving these funds needed to buy into why we were distributing the money, what the benefit to them was going to be, and what the expectations were going to be in terms of program performance. And so as we started this process, I think the thing that we were the most cognizant of was that one size did not fit all. And we, when we very be, initially began this project, I was relatively new to CTE, and it was very eye-opening for me to understand that a comprehensive pathway program in an urban district looks very, very different than a program within a rural district. And when you talk about limitations in terms of scheduling and transportation and resources, the one thing we didn't want to do is set up arbitrary performance measures that were going to be punitive to some of our smaller and rural districts. So the key stakeholder piece in that was not only just for us as an agency to hear from the field, but to have the field talk to each other. And so if I had any great takeaway from that process, it was having the, the superintendent of our state's largest district talking to one of our principals from one of our smaller districts. Because when you are dealing with the challenges and strategies within your own community and your own school system, you're not necessarily aware either of some of the challenges that face different districts. And so from my perspective, having a common understanding and a shared goal was that critical first step before we could move forward. Great, thanks. Um, so looking at the second strategy, uh, using data to focus your work and evaluate the impact of the program, uh, I know it can be tempting sometimes to just throw money at an issue and hope that it resolves itself, but I think Idaho has been really intentional in how you use data to target those funds to meet, uh, to, to uh, address some of the most critical needs in the districts that you're serving. So. Could you talk a little bit about how, um, how you're using data to, to focus the work and then, you know, I know that this is still just the first year um, of implementation, but how do you plan to use data in the future to assess in, uh, the impact of the program? Sure, and I, and I think everyone saw that my slides and my presentation were actually very heavily focused on the data piece of this. Um, when we talk about the concept of data-driven decisions, that sounds very formal, but it also sounds very ambiguous. And so for us, we really wanted to identify data elements that not only had a common understanding in the field, but also had a common value in the field. And so when I talk about the three measures that we ultimately implemented, it's because those measures mean something and they resonate with the field and there's a common understanding that that data carries weight in terms of how we look at our programs and how we want to shape how our programs perform. I think one of the challenges is that money doesn't necessarily fix everything. Uh, one of the things that I didn't get to talk about in this uh, presentation was that in the long term, we want our program quality initiative to be more incentive funding based, and we want it to be an incentive system to some of our high performing programs but we recognize that we can't expand that opportunity until we've helped build the foundation of our programs. So that's why for this year and potentially the next two fiscal years, we will be providing only technical assistance grants. And our rationale behind that is that if we can get our programs with better curricular materials, better equipment, uh, and better opportunities, we will slowly start to see some improvements in program performance. And so even though we just made our initial distribution, we are going to be monitoring more closely the trend data with our workforce readiness assessments, with our technical skill assessments, and our overall student organization uh, membership rates. It's been an interesting process throughout that, that there are barriers for students in a lot of our small and rural communities in terms of access to their CTSO and their ability to fundraise. And we really want our students to take advantage of those state leadership conferences and those leadership experiences that that CTSO provides. So we'll be using this initial distribution of funds to start identifying some baseline data for those grant recipients and see how they start to do over the next several years. Great. Um, and then it, I think the third and fourth strategies are uh, a little interrelated, so I'll ask this question together. But I'm curious about what role partnerships and technology played 
um, both at the state level in uh, getting this uh, initiative off the ground, but probably more, um, uh, you know, m more relevant at the, at the local level. You know, I'm curious if there are any um, districts who applied and received some of these grant funds that are working to um, partner with CTSOs or maybe local businesses in this area, in their area, um, to build support for the work uh, and improve uh, the quality of their programs. So I think the the partnership focus that we have right now is probably less focused on specific industries and more focused on partnerships within and among and between districts and programs. One of the things that we that we use this grant application process for, and I talked about it a little bit, was the partnerships between teachers and administrators. And for several years, I think I took for granted that everybody spoke CTE and that everybody understood the magic and the value of what we do for students. And what I have learned as I've worked more closely with teachers and administrators is that CTE is often just a very small equation within the overall district landscape. And so when we wanted to talk about partnerships, we actually started at the very, very, very basic level. Are you talking to your principal? Are you talking to your teachers? Does your superintendent know what your program does? And so I think this first year we're starting much more narrow. Um, I want there to be a larger and more ongoing discussion with industry, with internship opportunities, um, with helping with employment tours and that type of outreach. But I think in order to do that, I think what we want to see is this buy-in from administrators who wear so many different hats to help them understand CTE could really change the the go on rate for our state, the opportunities for your students, and the investment in your local community. And I think opening their eyes to that and getting teachers and administrators talking was a critical first step for us. Um, we had one of our largest districts attend our, uh, we did a training for this last fall, and we invited all of our lead teachers and our administrators for a half day training in which I walked them through the grant and the performance criteria. We gave them their preliminary data and helped them understood what it meant. So we spent about four hours at each one of these meetings and we did a total of 16 meetings and we did one-on-one -on -one, um, discussions and focus groups with a total of 420 secondary teachers and administrators. And we had one of our teachers say, after she attended this training, I've worked in my district for three years and this is the first meeting I've ever had with a principal. And for me, that right there made it all worthwhile because we connected some relationships, we forged some partnerships, and we fostered relationships that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And so <clears throat> that I don't think really ties into the technology piece. Um, if anything, we probably did less technology in this process and more face-to-face -face interaction. But I do think that as we made those connections with the field personally, we were able to provide them with a lot of freedom about how they might use technology within their classrooms and how we, they might use them within their programs. I know I talked a little bit about CTE Digital, but that's just one very small part of the equation. In fact, as I'm looking through some of the initial awards, I mean, we awarded everything from laptops, plasma cutters, um, curricular materials, lots of iPads. The, um, the interesting thing with some of our laser printers, uh, when we talk about innovation and technology, was the number of districts and programs who are going to use those twofold. One, if there is program standards that align with that piece of equipment and how it ties into the program itself, and then two, partnering with their CTSO to use those materials as either part of their school store or part of their fundraising activities for their student organization within their community. So I think we looked at this lots of different ways throughout the process. Great. And uh, I think the, the last question probably uh, answers itself, you know, looking at how uh, the program quality initiative is an, is an example of uh, seeding, funding, investing resources in order to spark innovation uh, in a way that can be scaled. I mean, I think you've, uh, the program kind of checks those boxes, but is there anything that you would say to kind of like tie a bow on that? 
um, and provide any advice or lessons for other state policymakers or local policymakers who are on the phone? Sure, and I think that and there's a question up here already that says, say more about your cotton candy investments. What labor market data did you use to verify they were in demand? I need to clarify, uh, we did not actually award funds for the content candy maker, it was actually three snow cone machines. Um, but the concept still applies. And so when we talk about innovation, there's an element of that that is just trust and risk. Um, and there is a piece of this process that is also giving our districts a little bit of autonomy to know what they need um, and to give them a little bit of room to see if they can make that work. So no, there's, there was not going to be any sort of labor market data regarding our snow cone machines, um, but we also know from a fundraising perspective, it's a very nominal dollar amount and it's something in their community they felt like would get students interested and in talking about and engaged in their student organization. And so I think that's also an element there of how we tried to scale some investments um, because we didn't, we didn't spend a whole lot of money on that district, but we supported their concept and we, what we did is empower them to take those next steps. And so when we talk about that proof of concept and those partnerships, and I think working with our policymakers, credibility and trust go a really long way. And I think all of that hinges on the idea of transparency. And I think the single biggest reason that this process is proving to be successful is that we have been very open and transparent about what we are trying to accomplish with this money, how we are trying to invest in our districts, how we're trying to support our rural programs, while at the same time our number one goal and our number one priority as a state is to, is to support our students and to help ensure that they are having um, positive experiences and that we're improving student learning outcomes. And so I think if we can come to the table and really work on trying to do the right thing for the right reason, it makes those conversations a lot easier. And it makes policymakers that much more inclined to support us. And it makes teachers and administrators that much more supportive to buy in on why we should be on this journey together. Great, well, I think that is a great note to end on. So we're actually going to move it over to our Q&A section. So if anybody has any questions, uh, that they would like to ask, either of me or of Amy, um, you can enter those in the Q&A chat, the Q&A box, not the chat box. Um, they are two separate um, boxes. But if you type those in, then we'll, we'll address some of those questions. Yeah. There was one that came in uh, during Amy's presentation. Um, so there's a question about uh, if you could provide an example of how the incentive funding will work or will be planned to work. I know that that's still kind of a, um, in development, it's more of a phase two activity under the initiative, but could you kind of give an example of what that would look like? Yeah, you bet, you bet, no, and that's a great question because when I pulled up that initial laundry list from June of 2015, our ultimate goal would be to pull all of that type of data together in an aggregate format um, and then provide a ranking system for all of our programs. The challenge with that right now is not only the fact that we don't have access to all of that data, but the larger philosophical discussion on of the data elements that we've identified and of the data elements that stakeholders have identified, how much weight do each of those measures carry in how we define a high quality CTE program? And so we've been very, very slow to work on this piece of the process and to implement that because the last thing we want to do is identify a program as high quality and have that not be meaningful or consistent measures. I will tell you that we will be looking at all of the things that we're looking right now at the technical assistance grant, but at the other end of the, of the spectrum. So for the grants, for the uh, technical assistance grants, it was anything below the statewide average. When we look at the incentive grants, we want to be looking at those top performers. And we haven't even identified those baseline performances or what that would be, whether it would be the top 10%, the top 20%, or a more nuanced measure depending on the assessment and depending on the overall participation rates. So I would anticipate you'll be hearing more from us about that. I think the key piece with the incentive funding is that that will not be application-based. What we don't want is to provide yet another burden and yet another application process. What we want to be able to do is provide an automated function that we can send that money out to the field that said, hey, listen, 
We looked at your program. It's doing well. Here's some funds to keep investing in your program. Keep up the good work. Great, so we had another question that came in. Um, it says, we're in a consortium that includes rural districts and non-rural. How do we make sure that all are being recognized with funding? Um, so I think that's a good question. Amy, I don't know if uh, you have any insights or any thoughts about that. Well, I guess my first question would be whether, are we talking about a Perkins consortium? Because, um, I would, for the for the purpose of the question, let's assume yes. Let's, okay, and I think that yeah, and if that's if that's not the case, we can certainly redirect this. But under that umbrella, I think that's one of the challenges in how consortium members work together on their Perkins plan. I know in Idaho historically we were not as structured or prescriptive as what we needed to be in requiring our consortium members to collaborate. And so our consortiums had taken a lot of different approaches in terms of shifting the money from year to year or different districts prioritizing it. And I, I again, would, would reiterate that when you've got consortiums of different sizes and different needs, getting those leads at the table and getting those representatives at the table before you sign up on those plans to make sure that that investment is going to help support all of the students. And that may look different from year to year, and I think that's one of the things that we have given ourselves as a state a little bit of latitude, is to let our consortiums demonstrate how there is a collective agreement that if we're going to do a bigger investment in one district this year, how that will benefit the other districts. And then in subsequent years, how we share that investment. Um, and it is a challenge when you've got districts of vastly different sizes, but we've had some really good luck with our larger districts recognizing that they have an inherent advantage um, and being more generous and helping to support their small or rural, more rural counterparts. Great, and um, I would just kind of add to that, some of the lessons that we heard from states that we interviewed as part of the uh, research we did, um, they shared some examples of districts that had uh, partnered together and were aligning course schedules that were um, kind of pooling their funds to make sure that students in those most rural schools um, could be served, even if there wasn't a program available in their building. Um, so there are plenty of examples. We have a couple um, local programs that we've recognized through our National Excellence in Action Award, where they're located in an urban area, but they serve, um, it, they'll, they'll be, uh, you know, we have a couple area technical centers that we've recognized that serve students who are coming from rural areas. So I think it's an important um, consideration to think about how the consortium can take responsibility for all of those students that they serve and make sure that they're able to access um, uh, opportunities that are available uh, in other schools. So uh, we had another question that came in um, asking us what states we canvassed during the past year. Um, I'm not gonna be able to remember all of them off the top of my head, but we spoke and we've highlighted um, all of these in our uh, in the four briefs, but we spoke with uh, Nebraska, um, Idaho, North and South Dakota, um, Kentucky. Uh, we've got an example from West Virginia in there, um, Hawaii, so we're really, uh, and Alaska. So we're really looking at uh, kind of understanding that Rural communities um, vary from state to state, and and you know a community in Appalachia might have different challenges as a uh, western community or as a, a district in the Rockies. Um, and we're trying to recognize that that variation. Um, and we have a, a bunch of you know examples from from states that are pretty applicable across different geographic settings. So we are now uh, almost at time. So I just want to wrap up by, first of all, thanking all of you who are uh, on the call with us today. I really appreciate your time and giving us the opportunity to share some of these lessons. Uh, Amy, I appreciate uh, your input into this initiative and the work that we've been doing with the CTE on the Frontier Series, as well as your time this afternoon uh, to speak and share some lessons from Idaho. Just a couple final housekeeping notes. Um, the recording from today's webinar along with a copy of the slides, will be available on our website at careertech.org backslash webinars um, within the next 24 to 48 hours. 
I also encourage you uh, check out this, this resources. They're available online at the uh, Learning Networks Resource Center and follow uh, Advanced CTE at CTE Works or follow the Idaho Division of CTE at Idaho CTE. Uh, and lastly, just on a final note, uh, when you close out of your uh, WebEx uh, browser, you'll, be, you'll see a quick survey. And we just encourage you to fill out that survey, give us some feedback on today's presentation, and let us know if you have any thoughts about how we can improve the quality of our content. Thank you all for uh, tuning in this afternoon, and uh, hope you have a great remainder of your day.